Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is Cutting Through the Matrix on the 11th of September 2016. It's interesting about think tanks and how they operate and and so you can get into awfully warped ways of thinking, you know, really warped ways of thinking. Because the whole idea in think tanks, especially in intelligence services, is how to outwit enemies and also look at how history will be written if they bring on some kind of an event. Therefore, they go around, before they start everything, they go around all the logic that, that you'd have naturally to something to find out how your, your logic will actually work and then subvert it by preparing stuff in advance to make it, to complicate the events and so on. Then they're always in charge of it, you see. So and often, often too, it's not cause and effect. Sometimes it's the effect they're actually after. What has been the effect, for instance, of 9-11, you see? And this is, this is a very classic uh, technique of intelligence services. Uh, what's happened is that the effect is more important, you see, than, and, and the effect drives the cause. So it's not cause and effect, it's, a, it's the effect you're after which drives the, co the cause. So the effect is that a group who pre-planned invading all those countries across the Middle East, on the list, you see, the New American Century group had written in the 90s they wanted to take these countries out. And so if they took them out, it would guarantee generations of people who had lost relatives and, and friends and everything through, through Allied bombing across their nations. And it would be perpetual warfare. That's retaliation, you see. That's all warfare they knew would have to be what they, what they then called terrorist warfare since those countries don't have air forces and, and all that kind of thing to retaliate with. Therefore, they'll send out their, their mad bombers and so on. So they knew this all in the 90s before it all happened. So that was the, that was the effect. It was the effect that they were after. Perpetual war, a state of what appears to be perpetual terrorism on the public so that governments across their allied regions could then go into action together and change the system, basically. Now, it didn't mean a change of those who ruled the system. It was an upgrade for the rulers behalf, on their behalf, actually, into the next phase of things, because now you have less freedoms. You're all monitored by law and for your own good to keep you safe and so on, etc., uh, etc. Et and now you're into the planned society, planned economy stage. That all comes out of this war on terror, which allows them to then openly monitor all of us and collect all the data on everybody and, and classify it and so on, yada yada, and put into sections of this and that and the other, depending on what you buy, eat, and you name it, blah, blah, blah. You couldn't, you couldn't really get that far w without the terrorist uh, threat, you see. So there you go, that's, that's standard intelligence. How do we get, how do we get the effect? Well, you must first uh, create the Pearl Harbor event, as they said themselves. Uh, that just happened, because they're awfully fortunate for things just happening, and they get the effect. So there you go, bingo. It's all here, and it's here to stay, because I've read the articles for years, even on the air, when I was on the air, and I'd, I'd read about um, the top people in, at the NSA and, and so on, uh, and the Pentagon talking about get used to it, it's here to stay, they'll, they'll always be living under all these terrorist rules now. In other words, it's not going through a period until things calm down and then you go back to what used to be used to be uh, the normal, even the normal's never been normal. <laughs> but that will never happen, you see. They want to be, they, they've said this is going to be for intergenerational now. And it's permanent. So there you go, everything happens that way in real life because you're not run by any, any real honest system. Uh, you never have been, to be honest with you. Even to come back to the days of Francis Bacon, he said the same thing because he was much like Machiavelli who would write a, a kind of treatise of how clever and cunning they were to, to, to kings and queens so they could be an advisor and, and Bacon said the same thing. He said, never tell the public uh, the truthful reason of why you're doing anything. Uh, tell them some fable or whatever. And that's what we get taught to is we're taught fables and nonsense, like children, you see, rather than the, any truth. Uh, simple things too, uh, also he also mentioned uh, that don't disparage attacks on something. 
Uh, if you want a lot of money to come in fast, don't put an A tax out because they'll complain, grumble, and might even revolt. So what you do is you put a penny on everything as a tax, and and, and they don't see it as a big amount. Of money. They, they don't tally up how much extra is a week when they tally all the pennies up. You see, we really are played with, aren't we? We honestly are. And the thing is, too, we're trained to hand our brains over to other people. Really. Most folk don't have much confidence in themselves. They don't. They've been raised up, as Bertrand Russell said, that was intention, he was all for it, and trained to, to listen to experts, what appears to be experts. If you lived in, in a world of experts, you would never have a bank crash across the nation, or the world for that matter. It wouldn't happen. All these top economists, uh, being top economists, obviously, are rather over-glorified nonsense makers if we keep having bank crashes. Because apparently they never see it coming. Eh? Except for a few mm, of their own investors at the top who manage just to, you know, make a lot of money out of it sort of thing. But that, that's how the, this con works. You see, you're trained to have no real confidence in your own conclusions on anything. In fact, you're taught not to have your own conclusions. You adopt someone else's conclusions. That's why you have debates on television non-stop, ad nauseum, on nonsensical things with always generally two opponents. You know? And it's not a real debate anyway. It's, it's a witty thing. Because it's pre-planned before they go on television who's supposed to appear to win it, you see? And then that becomes your opinion. And sure enough, the, the polls are done the next day, quiet polls for, by MIT and all the rest of them on, on your chatter on the net, etc. And sure enough, that's what you're prattling about. You've now adopted that opinion. It's, it's very clever, but that's how deep it, it goes, to be honest with you. Really, you, you have very little choice in anything today unless you break out of it and make your own choices on things. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been talking about the fact you're run by all these unelected organizations, they're all really one. They're all branches, specialized branches of the one, you see, for the planet. And uh, for instance, the Council on Foreign Relations, people in the States know what that is, or they should know, because it's been running them for about 100 years. And, and in Britain, of course, the, the parent club is the Royal Institute for International Affairs, which again is a private, same private organization um, this unelected, these are both unelected by the public, and yet they create the policy for governments one after the other, you see. They create the strategy for war uh, as well, intelligence and everything else. They also create the opinions of the general public and then within the nations because they bring in all the top uh, editors and conglomerate media corporations, so on, the heads of them, and the top journalists. They give you your famous names that you come, you come to think are really geniuses in, on the media, uh, on television or whatever, and, and that becomes, they give you your opinions and everything. But on Wikipedia, for instance, this is, the Council on Foreign Relations, CFR, was founded in 1921. Now, it was already on the go, by the way, before that, you see, under different names, because it all belonged to this Anglo-American establishment group, uh, which had different names under their Lord Alfred Milner group. He was from Germany, by the way, but uh, and some of his staff, top staff, were as well, and uh, although they didn't see themselves as German. But anyway, they wanted a world government, which they would control and organize. They brought eugenics into it. They'll believe in all that kind of stuff that was around at that time. And they wanted to bring world wars around as well to to unite, to force the countries to unite together by getting them up to their knees through starvation, rationing, depletion of natural resources and so on for war until you just gave up your sovereignty. And then they would run the whole planet. Very elitist. And they still run it today the same way. And, and they always use great sounding th things uh, to get their agendas through. But it's almost opposite they actually, they actually mean, you know. So here it, says, it was founded in 1921. So say that was officially founded, but no, it was already under the, uh, on the go under Colonel Mandel House, for instance, um, who, who he was the handler for President Wilson, who helped get, he got the, the Federal Reserve through and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's the United States 4,900 member organization. Now, it's actually more than that, because that's the general group. And there's a, a, an outer group 
in an inner inner party group. That was all explained by their own historian, uh, Carl Quigley. He was an insider. Anyway, that's how they, they build themselves. Uh, a non-profit publisher and think tank, specializing in U.S. foreign policy and international affairs. Now, why... <laughs> People, if only folk would have stopped and said, why, why, is it, why is your government that you, you think you elect um, obeying some private club, you see? What's, what, does it make a mockery of the whole election business, doesn't it? Yeah. So it makes foreign policy and and, uh, and it's in charge of international affairs. And by the way, all the top guys who get appointed are all members of it too. The guys who get appointed into your governments. It's headquartered in New York City, with an additional office in Washington, D.C., and its membership has included senior politicians, more than a dozen secretaries of state, CIA directors, bankers, lawyers, professors, and senior media figures. The CFR promotes globalization, free trade, which isn't free, of course, uh, reducing financial regulations on transnational corporations, that's themselves and so on, all the boys are represent, and economic consolidation into regional blocks such as NAFTA or the European Union. And that's true enough, they, they boasted they drafted up NAFTA and handed it to governments of Canada, the US and Mexico, and develops policy recommendation that res- reflects these goals, basically. And, and by the way, there's stacks of members who are also in your, your high levels of, c- of civil service in the government. The CFR meetings that convene government officials, global business leaders, and prominent members of the intelligence and foreign policy community. It's all one organization, isn't it? Eh? Isn't it? And this get together to discuss international issues. Eh? <laughs> The CFR publishes is the bi-monthly journal called Foreign Affairs and runs the David Rockefeller Studies Program, which influences foreign policy by making recommendations to the presidential administration and diplomatic community, testifying before Congress, interacting with the media, and publishing on foreign policy issues. So there you are. Now, is this, is this the top intelligence agency that all the others belong to, or what is it? Hmm? Because they say, as secretive, remember to join this thing, you don't put in an application, you wait until they ask you. That they're going to ask you. That's it. And then go through some of the history here. 1918 to 45. And they could see Elihu Root was the head of the first Council of Foreign Relations. And towards the end of World War I, a working fellowship of about 150 scholars called the Inquiry, this is, what the, this is the, the nonsense again, was tasked to brief President Woodrow Wilson about options for the post-war war world when Germany was defeated. This academic band, right, including Wilson's closest advisor and long-term friend, Colonel, that was not a title he gave himself, by the way, Edward M. House, that's Mandel House, as well as Walter Lippmann, met to dis- assemble the strategy for the post-war world. The team produced more than 2,000 documents detailing and analyzing the political, economic, and social facts globally that would be helpful for Wilson in the peace talks. Remember, remember they tried to use the League of Nations, which they created, and they put um, President Wilson as the, the, the main pusher for the whole thing uh, to get the world government set up then. That, that was, a, that was the, the, the real purpose of it all. Anyway, the reports formed the basis for the 14 points which outlined Wilson's strategy for peace after war's end. And these scholars then travelled to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 and participated in the discussions there. It says, as, as a re- now there, <laughs> believe you me, it was all planned before that because the real boss, the top of the inner party over in London, as I say, it was Lord Alfred Milner, and he had his boys creating the Boer War, and then even as it was ending, he was pushing for the propaganda through all the editors of the newspapers which they owned to push for war with Germany. But before the 20th century had even started. See, you're always living through the long-term plan, business plan these guys have, you see. Same bunch. 
unelected, as I say. And uh, so here you are. And it says, decide to create an Anglo-American organization called the Institute for International Affairs, which would have offices in London and in New York. It says, due to the isolationist views prevalent in American society at the time, meaning about common sense left, the scholars had difficulty gaining traction with their plan and turned their focus instead to a set of discrete meetings that had been taking place since June 19, 1918 in New York City under the name uh, Council on Foreign Relations. So in other words, they tried to fool the American public, which they did pretty good at, you know, pretty well. And it says uh, the meetings were headed uh, by the corporate lawyer, Elio Root, who'd served as Secretary of State under President Theodore Roosevelt uh, and attended by 108 high-ranking officers of banking. So there you go. So that's who runs the whole darn thing at the very top there. Manufacturing, trading, and finance companies together with many lawyers, all the ones that, that helped to bring on the wars and profit from them and so on. The members were proponents of Wilson's internationalism, and that's awfully important to remember, but were, were particularly concerned about the effect that the war and the Treaty of Peace might have on post-war business. And it goes on and on and on with, with very, very superficial stuff, you know. But it does tell you some of the characters were involved and how some of the heads of universities were involved too. I mean, you've got to get everybody on board. If, they could, if their intention is also to brainwash a whole generation of managerial class uh, students. Uh, and so, you, yeah, they have them all through universities and so on. They give you all the movements, to, all the things to, to complain about, to, to protest, all that kind of stuff for themselves. They work, by the way, with the Ford Foundation, they run them actually, and the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, they run it through foundations, charitable foundations as they call themselves. Uh, and they're all connected, these charitable foundations. They run thousands of non-governmental organizations. And this touches on some of them, but not, a, not an awful lot. It's, it's very... Limited indeed, but that's that's what. What's the as I say? What's the point in voting when these things are there already? You know, you, you'll never hear any of the, the politicians even mentioning this organisation, because more, all well actually all the, the ones who run at the top, as, as Carl Quigley said, had always been a, a member, a quiet one, open or secret, of all parties. Doesn't matter about the ones down below. They they, they all take uh, membership if it's, if it's offered to them because they're all they're all got their hands out as you well know as politicians are like. But the heads already have been selected, etc., and that's how it works. So anyway, <laughs> I, I just touch on the one thing, such as um, how it's, it's always involved with the military too. They always use your military. And it says the Council on Foreign Relations uh, serves as a breeding ground for important American policies such as mutual deterrence, arms control, and nuclear non-proliferation. In 1962, the group began a program of bringing select Air Force officers to the Harold Pratt House, that's the one in New York, to study alongside its scholars, the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, so it requested they start similar programs for their own officers. See? All the top NATO officers, by the way, are also members. And I've got some of their books here, talking about world government, how they'll use everything to bring about world government, you see. So anyway, um, they always make sure your national security advisors are members, and every, everybody's a member. Everybody's a member that matters. And that's the way it is, folks. You know. And David Rockefeller, of course, uh, was a big, big player. He helped set up a lot of these things. Uh, oh, oh, actually, old man Rockefeller did all that stuff too. And David Rockefeller took it over. It's a long story, but again, you're going through a big business plan, as I've said before, and you're living through the script. And they're awfully good at keeping you going. Awfully good. You know, even when it's the time you go to war with countries for their good, you see, these boys good. Uh, they, they always make all the excuses and reasons until you're furious at it, and you'll, and you'll be all for it. They're awfully good at that. Now, what they also have set up, I don't think it mentions it here, it was all the, the G groups, you know, the, the group of four, the group of eight, the group of 10, 20, and all the rest of it, you see, the G20. That, that, that's, that was standard part of the group that came out of England from the Alfred Milner group, and they still use that technique today with groups for this, for that, and the other thing. Every area of life across the planet, they've got groups, you see. And once again, these groups are private. They, they don't <laughs> change anybody's uh, constitutions or charters 
they, they simply ignore them and, and create a little club. And then the more they, they meet, you see, the more it sounds very official and sanctioned by some kind of legality. But in reality, it, it isn't. It's a club. But whatever they decide, and it's all this decided long before they meet for these clubs, meetings, because all the stuff that they've going, they're going to sign into laws and treaties and all that, it's already done by the Sherpas that go way out in advance over years, making sure everybody's on board with all the leaders of this, that, and the other on board. And it's all signed. So they have a big feast and all that at the G20. And the same thing with uh, even the Bilderberg as well, where you're given 10 minutes maybe to speak, and that's it. It's all planned that way. Now, if you look at any of the groups, like the G20, you'll find they have what they call Chatham House rules on what they are not allowed to say to the general public. In other words, they'll lie their teeth off or say nothing at all. And the Chatham House rules are the rules set up by the Royal Institute for International Affairs, which they also use in the Council on Foreign Relations. It's the same organization, you see. So all the groups which they create to do specialized functions like the G20, which is to globalize the world for the big top international bankers for their system, the central banking system, the IMF, which they own, it's privately owned, and the, the, the Bank for International Settlements, privately owned, all set up. All these organizations are set up by the one group, this private club. And that's what we exist for, to serve as private club. So here it says 2008 G20 Washington Summit for the G20. Oh, it says, uh, the 2008 G20 Washington Summit on Financial Markets in the World Economy took place November 14 to the 15, 2008 in Washington, D.C. It achieved general agreement amongst the G20 on how to cooperate in key areas so as to strengthen economic growth, deal with the 2008 financial crisis. Now, these are the same guys who apparently never see it coming. No, it was planned to go that way. Understand that. And what did they get out of it? More loot. They, they plundered the world, remember by getting bail, bailouts from all the taxpayers across the planet. So they get more money for, for all their covert operations across the planet for future things that we're up to, you see. And then they talk about some, the summit resulted from an initiative by the French and European Union President Nicolas Sarkozy, but it's not really French actually, and the British Prime Minister Gordon Brown, God knows what he really is either, in connection with the G7 finance ministers on October 11th, 2008, United States President George W. Bush stated that the next meeting of the G20 would be important in finding solutions to the economic crisis. Well, yeah, they keep bailing uh, out the big banks that rip you off because it's planned that way. And then they put more restrictions on all of you. Then they give themselves a right because they own all the big top corporations, the right to start gouging you and, and upping the prices on everything big time especially in the energy as well, you see, because they've said in their own writings that the, the too cheap energy, it's too cheap, uh, encourages good health. And if they're going to depopulate the world, I'm not kidding you, <laughs> this is what they say, uh, then then they, they have to uh, start cutting down back on energy, which heats water, it's all of these things, you see, for washing, blah, blah, and hygiene, all these different things. And if, if you can start to control all these valuable things, and then the folk will start to see disease break out and stuff like that. No kidding you. Everyone's been worked out and thought out in big think tanks, all belonging to the same, you know, uh, secretive group, which is open. It's an open secret, as I say. And then they give you some of the preliminary history of it, too, of Bretton Woods. These are other things, too, the same organization brought out before. By the way, they always, they always had communists, or would appear to be communists on board with them. They're always multi-billionaire communists, but that's okay, because it's the same group of people you see at the very top. And they always bring out uh, the, the usual uh, uh, characters. They'll deal with putting forth papers, which they then implement into policy across the world. This private club does this, you see, that you don't elect. And they, they tell you what they what they, they they plan to do about all the money system and so on. And as I say, give more power to the big corporations, which are also members of uh, of uh, the same secret organisation. Quite some, isn't it? Really, when you think about it, quite some indeed. And also, I'll put up a, a link for members on the CFR's board of directors, you know. No, it doesn't have them all, by the way. There's a lot of folk who are awfully, awfully secretive, you know. 
But they give you quite a few of them. Former U.S. Secretary of Treasury, for instance, uh, Rubin. He was also a high-level executive at Goldman Sachs. They all just have musical chairs in them and with the same top organizations. And um, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, all the heads, etc., and, yeah, and, and it's a lot more, of course. You can just check the names themselves, and if you want you to really check the names, they have a lot in common. And Richard Haas, for instance, is a president, and uh, he's always given out the... He gives out little um, statements and little write-ups once in a while, and that goes to all his juniors underneath him in the CFR who, who then go to town to show, show you how good they are, and they, they like his boots and all that, and they hope to get up the ladder by doing so in the newspapers, you see. And so there's Haas and uh, Abazed, um, and so on. Alan Blinder, uh, all the reserve board characters and all the rest of it. They're all in there. Everybody's, anybody who's anybody is in there, you see. That's how they become anybody. That's the, the, this, this organization makes them into somebody, you see. That's how it's done. That's how all things are done this, in this system here. Uh, they've even got Lawrence D. Fink, the chairman chief executive officer of BlackRock, you know. Uh, things like that. And a lot of things you, you don't even know what, what they are, if they even existed, but you, you'll see them there. Awfully important. Awfully important. And Timothy Geithner, etc., etc. Uh, these are some of the members. But they also have the secretive members of the inner party, the higher up ones, you see. And even the outer party are not supposed to know about them either, those outer, the, the inner party. Here's an article about the G20 here. This meeting is on right now. The G20 has set up a forum to combat world oversupply. Imagine that, eh? So now they're going to start deciding how much you're allowed to produce in any particular thing to suit the big corporations for the, that are global, you see. And this is from uh, the Bangkok Post. And it says here that... Um, the group of G20 country leading economies will set up a global forum to combat world industrial oversupply. Which means, literally, uh, if, you, if you want to start a business as well, you ain't going to get, get it started if, if they'll have, have you on the list. Or oh, like, we've already got enough doing that, I'll say, you see. Anyway, uh, a senior European Union diplomat said Monday at a summit in China. Uh, the global steel industry is assailed by a huge oversupply with Chinese demand plummeting as its economic growth has slowed. And the final com uh, communique will say that measures like subsidies are a root cause of market distortions. You see, all the big corporations too, they get massive. It's corporate welfare. All the big ones, the biggest ones, all get corporate welfare. You see? This is, and a forum will be set up to monitor the process of cutting over capacity. In other words, the government will just simply cut the cash to certain ones who are not quite up there on, on all the top uh, club uh, membership lists and, and so on. And uh, I'll leave it all to the big boys at the very, very top, you see. They'll still be getting all the subsidies. And it's not just for steel, that's how they're going to start it off, you see. So the global steel industry is assailed by huge oversupply, etc. And it says the G20 host uh, produces half the world's steel and it stands accused of dumping on global markets by the US and European Union. Well, they've been doing it for about 20 years now, I think. So there's, they've just noticed it, supposedly, which is nonsense. Both sides have slapped anti-dumping duties on each other's products in various sectors. But Chinese firms are suffering crippling losses from low steel prices too, and Beijing has repeatedly pledged to cut over capacity in the country. Now remember, don't be, don't be confused. When they're using nations' names here, like China, and they'll use Beijing, you know, etc. Because remember that many of the big corporations in China used to be based in your countries. They're actually American or whatever it happens to be. Well, they'll use that title too. They're really international, but that, that, or internationalist, but that's the way it is. That's how it's been for a long, long time. So it says, so it says ahead of the summit, U.S. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew said President Obama would press Beijing to limit steel over capacity of the meeting. And it says excess capacity distorts markets and the environment, harms our workers. Why are they ever worried about <laughs> harming the workers? Eh? And runs counter to our efforts to achieve strong, sustainable and balanced growth. Uh, Lew said in Washington, it said. Jack Lew. 
and China would not be named in the final document to be issued after the gathering in the eastern city of Hangzhou, the diplomat said, and had committed to participate in the forum. So in other words, when they put it through in the document and try to omit uh, the fact to put China um, complaining about it, etc., etc. But this will be across the board on many, many things that will happen uh, in all countries now. As I say, if you want to start, it's the, the planned economy, the planned nation. Uh, the planned nation also has uh, population control. And eventually, step by step, they bring it into, uh, literally, do they need so many workers in your nation? They've already discussed that years ago, long before I was born. Uh, how many workers will need by the year so and so and so and so? Well, we don't need all of them. Well, how do we cut back on them? Blah, 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 blah. You see, it's all done. See, you, all of us collectively, we are collectively the business. All of us. I've said that many times. We are the business. We're farmed like, you know, they build you up for wars when they want you to build up for wars and, and all that. Or when they want you to build you what your numbers up to, just, just like China did for the factories, when you had factories. And then when you don't, oh, they want to call you down, blah, 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 don't have children, don't have children. You know, you know that's, that's how it works. Just like a farmer, you know. That's how it works. But uh, that, that's the world you live in. And again, it's vastly different from the one that they train you exists. And you have lifelong training. They actually call it that lifelong training through, through news and media to keep the illusion going that you, you really are independent. Each person's independent. Make your own decisions. Lifelong training. I've got articles here too, mind you, where the, the president of China has, has said in speeches that uh, he's pushing the West, pushing the West to make sure that they stick to the agreement for Western depopulation. Well, let's see how that will work. Well, we'll see more, more articles out there about all oh, the dangers of overpopulation, so you're cut back and having children, or, or will the government simply make it harder and more expensive to have a child, or, or what, what? How do you depopulate folks? Hmm? Remember, in the real think tanks, the, the sky is a limit. Nothing, nothing's taboo. <laughs> think about it. Right? Maybe introduce a few diseases here and there, eh? or I say there's a few diseases and spray it with toxic pesticides that, well, that'll definitely start killing a few folk here and a few folk there. Not all at the same time. That way, it doesn't cause a panic. You see, it just steps up the the death rate. That's all. There's many ways to achieve an objective without the public ever really catching on. That's the real world, folks. You know, you're dealing with folk here. I keep telling, <laughs> telling people, we're dealing with folk in charge of your countries. They're all on board with slaughter across all parts of the world. Remember, the, the New American Century Project had, had top members of the same organization I'm talking about here on the military in Britain getting all prepared for it long before 9-11 came along in collusion with their branches in the U.S., with their members in the, the military, top of the military there too, with their project for New American Century, and how they'd introduce it to the public, and how they'd get them used to it, and how, we, how they'd get the wars going. All that kind of stuff was discussed and debated by them. And even right down to the so-called collateral damage of folk across the Middle East, how many folk would probably die and be slaughtered and so on. These, these folks sleep well at night, you understand. This is before anything ever happened. And you think that they wouldn't implement depopulation programs, covert ones, across your population? Really? Hmm. Now, I'm also going to put up links to stories. Uh, that are put out by, again, members of the CFR. In fact, Haas has got one out too. That's his instructions to all the lesser members in the media uh, to follow his, 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 uh, his article and to push in their media, who they're working for, the same kind of stories, you see, that, that the terrorist threat is now worse than it was before 9-11, you see. And that's the big push, because they wanted to stay this terrorism. Oh, they've got, they've got, they've got so many plans to how you can totally control all societies and lead them into the direction of the complete planned society, global society too. You see? And I mean really controlled, down to this, nothing you could do on your own without permission. 
That's already coming with us under the guise of sustainability, which these characters also rule, by the way, through their foundations and so on, and NGOs. Oh, you can't use that to heat yourself. Well, I'll die. Well, that's just tough cheese, isn't it? Are you think I'm kidding? Well, I'm not kidding, yeah. I'm not kidding. That's the way it really is, folks. And, as I say, uh, I'll put in the links to do with the terrorism here you stay, basically. The terrorism threat is worse than now than it was before 9 11. Yeah. So, in other words, the effect was important. You see, cause and effect. But the, 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 actually, the effect is what they were after, as I say, which is a lot of stirred up hornets' nests that are not going to calm down. You see, that's what you wanted. Now you've got it. I can remember the stories that came out with just people taking photographs of places in Britain and elsewhere after 9 11 happened and, and, and getting arrested because they wouldn't get their, their cameras over. Just taking photographs of historical buildings, things like that, statues, you name it. How fast we adapt to all till it's quite normal now, isn't it? How fast we adapt. And then we adapt every other part of it too so easily as well. People, people have been trained, a whole gen oh, goodness me, I mean, look, look how old the children are now that were born in, in 2001. And they think that this is all quite normal, having no privacy. In fact, they think privacy, as they've been taught at school, is just an awful hassle. It doesn't keep folk safe, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and the UK police will soon start putting bags over people's heads during arrests. How's that? This is just ordinary folk, you know, they're getting arrested for ordinary crime or whatever, or, or suspects. And you've, you've been trained for years now, you see. So you're always trained initially with movies, you know, stick them on over the heads of folk um, across the Middle East, you see, because they're terrorists or they're terrorists and they stick them on their heads. And, and then, of course, they put them in those hunking positions, they call it, until their legs give out, etc., etc. Well, this is all coming to you step by step. That's, that's what it's about, folks. Yeah. They treat you like an animal, you see, and, and we don't spook the animals just too much right away or the whole herd will get spooked. So make, make these nets, make it a kind of netting hood to start with, you see. And well, you know, it's not quite that. You can kind of, kind of see through it a little bit, you know. To start with, they do that. That's how they treat you folks. And you know something? It, it will work. Of course it will work, you know. Yeah. And it says the Metropolitan Police Officers will soon be able to use specially designed bags known as spit hoods, they're calling them. That's just something spitting, oh to cover suspects' heads during arrests and in police stations. The mesh bags are used to restrain suspects. How can you restrain them? And protect the police from those who might try to bite or spit at them. Hmm. The men insist the hoods are pre uh, prevent exposure to diseases and serious infection. In the pilot scheme, which starts in October, 32 custody units will receive material and training on how to use the spit guards. Do you think this is a joke? I mean, you'd think this kind of stuff would be put on, the, on, on April the 1st or something. Eh? Not these days. We'll accept anything these days. It says their application on any suspect will be recorded under use of force. They're not to be used on the streets initially. Now, you see, here, listen to this. So as not to incense the public and don't spook the herd. You see, that's what it means, incense the public. Don't spook them. Get them used to it gradually. But detail on how on their use after the pilot scheme expires has not been provided. I want to see uh, if they can sneak it through and the public just gradually kind of move and go back to chewing the cud, you see. The measure has been controversial with human rights groups which have deemed the use of spit hoods an alarming development and as cruel and degrading. And it may uh, breach uh, suspects' rights, with some police chiefs suggesting the hoods resemble the trappings adopted at Guantanamo Bay. Oh, my goodness, even even the police can see that. Boom. This is even the Met, that's the Metropolitan Office, was once opposed to them. Now they're all for it. Something got paid off, you see. That's how everything happens amongst these folk that, that you, you put your faith in. They get paid off. The hands are always out, you see. And it says we've seen many cases where police already have used these hoods unnecessarily and without justification, including on children and disabled people. Well, if you're disabled, they actually hate you all the more, I think. I really think they do, you know. 
oh, you're useless. Because that's that's all through society, through all movies and little bits and bites that, that sink into their their brains, you know. Until they, well, yeah, and you're like the UN said, you're, you're either a good producer and consumer. But obviously, that means you're a bad citizen, the world citizen, if you're only consuming and you're retired hmm? or disabled, you see. And it says, police have the power to use force against citizens when they have to, uh, using handcuffs, arm restraints, leg restraints, pepper spray, batons. Well, they also have... Uh, Ways to just totally disable you with electric um, shock and so on. The, su- the suggestion that officers need to be able to cover people's faces and heads is as far fetched as it is fr- uh, frightening. Spit hoods belong in horror stories, not in the streets of a civilized society. Uh, I wonder who's got the contract for it, too. You should follow everything up, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's always quite a, f- quite a laugh when you follow things up and find out. Who knows who in the House of Lords or, 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 or in the Parliament, you see, for that kind of thing. What corporation is getting it and so on. And, uh, I, I, mean, I know, I know, but it looked pretty bad these days with, with the poisoned food and all the injections we've been given since childhood. And so, I know we're getting pretty ugly, you know. But, I mean, when you start putting hoods on the people, well, that's it, eh? I'm going to mention, too, uh, that everything is to do, is to do with how you perceive things and how to introduce ideas into the public without spooking them. You see, that's what you do. A little step by step idea. And I've said from so many times. I think the big corporations are often, especially within the same area, they're really one big corporation with because they've got the same big giant shareholders, and they all get subsidies, as I say. And I think part of it is too when they aren't getting enough subsidies from from one nation. They'll simply move over and allow their the subsidiary or whatever to, to appear to buy them so they can, you know, get subsidy somewhere else. Anyway, this one's to do with um, Germany's Bayer company, or Bayer, which raised its offer to Monsanto to $65 billion uh, in a bid to create a global seeds and pesticide giant, you see. And you think of that power. Because really, they've got everybody, all their farmers are on their, their seeds and so on. And they patented seeds. You know? Even seeds that they hadn't even touched. It's just that no one had thought of patenting them before. They'd been, always been there for thousands of years. And that's what the con men do. Eh? But then they use the, the modified seeds as well. And, and then they can, uh, they can really up the price to the farmers by then selling them, along with the contract, of course, uh, selling them the, the, the actual pesticides to use with it, which is their own pesticides as well. And then that further kills you, etc. as they help as they feed the world, the con, you know, <laughs> because that was their big con. They spent millions on that con to feed the world, feed the world. You know, no, it was, it was to get total uh, hegemony over the whole planet, really, with their particular seeds. So every farmer has to go and buy the stuff from them. Everything's to do with monopoly, you see, for control. All controllers want monopoly. All control freaks do that. And it says, uh, combining Bayer and Monsanto would create the world's biggest agriculture supplier to be a, and a market leader in the US, Europe, and Asia. Now, here's the interesting part. Bayer's firm or farm business produces seeds as well as chemicals to com- combat weeds and insects, but it's better known for its healthcare products such as aspirin. And Alka-Seltzer, you know, Alka-Seltzer is for your stomach, which is right, because you see, after I've eaten all the, the GM stuff and the pesticides, you got a headache, and, and then the Alka-Seltzer, you use in the initial stages, before you know you've got stomach cancer, because that's what it did to all the animals that they tested the stuff on, you know, <laughs> all, the, all these particular chemicals and so on. But we're eating it, it's okay, we can get aspirin and Alka-Seltzer. Ah, I guess they've got the whole business sewn up then, eh? And I'll put this link up tonight as well. They do mention, though, that rivals include uh, the Dow Chemical, DuPont, and Syngenta. No, Dow Chemical and all these ones in DuPont are all part of the, the, and so was Monsanto, I believe, all part of the, the military industrial complex, you see. For those who don't know that, <laughs> in the chemical uh, side of it, too. They've all announced tie ups recently. Uh, so there you go, it's for Monopoly. Uh, and some have yet to be cleared by regulators. There you go. All one, basically. And then eventually you'll have one company that owns 
uh, all the, the gas, natural gas for the whole planet, and one all, own, own all the whatever else for the whole planet until they all admit they're just one company for the for the world Inc. <laughs> Uh, there you go. Well, that's how it works. you got to laugh at the whole system, eh? Because it is a joke. And the way they treat you is a joke too, isn't it? A real joke. And you look around to it and see how people get all worked up about things. It's, it's more of a joke. Really. How easy it is to control the populations. Even to get them to go to war. And things like that, eh? Now... Paul Craig Roberts, who, who talks about different, he, he, he does all the left wing stuff and so on, but he's, he's writing so many, many things as well. And it says in a few days it will be the 15th anniversary of 9-11 and November 22nd will be the 53rd anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas, Texas. These two state crimes against democracy destroyed American democracy, accountable government and the Constitution's protections of civil liberty. Well, I think it was gone long before that, to be honest. Because, as I say, when you had Mandel House running Wilson uh, uh, and getting you into World War I, uh, and running on the ticket too, Wilson, that, that, that he, would, he would not take you into the war. And the first thing he did was change his mind. They're awfully good at that, politicians, you know. And, um, and also getting the, the Federal Reserve ran through uh, so they could then tax the public uh, for the money they're going to spend on wars and so on, perpetual wars, you know. And that's how you pay up. You pay it off by taxing the people. And again, too, you've had the heads of, um, and I've mentioned them and read them on the air over many years to do with, with uh, the whole nonsense. The CFR member who, I think it was at Gardner, was it? He said rather than hitting the US Constitution head on and having retaliation and so on, which would always block it, uh, and you'd have to have an end run around it. Just simply ignore it and build things over it and around it. And that's what they did, you see. That's what they did. So yeah, I mean, this this certainly didn't didn't. Uh, this wasn't the be all and end all. But it says years after the damage done by these events, the American people no longer believe the official stories. And this is neither uh, does the government, but the government will not validate uh, the distrust that Americans now share. They'll, they'll never validate the distrust. The numbers don't admit anything. The share of the oligarchs' government by acknowledging the truth. The official explanation of the assassinations of President Kennedy never made any sense. And that is true. Across the planet, people have never made any sense. Videos of the assassination contradicted the official story, as did witnesses, and many credible people challenged the government's story. The CIA was faced with the official explanation becoming unglued and launched its media program stigmatizing doubters as conspiracy theorists. And that is true. That, that uh, whole idea of conspiracy, they coined that term, conspiracy theorists, to, to ridicule anybody in the future. So everything is psychology, isn't it? And it works awfully well. The CIA's psych warfare against the public succeeded at the time and for a number of years during which witnesses had mysterious deaths and the trail grew cold. And that's true, eh? I mean, in the real world, folk, they bump you off. They kill you. That's the real world. Oh, we're living in democracy. Really? And what movie was that in, you know? But it says, but by the late 1970s, there was so much public skepticism uh, of the official story that the US Congress took the risk of being labeled conspiracy cooks. The House Select Committee on Assassinations reopened the inquiry into JFK's murder. The House Committee concluded that the Warren Commission's investigation was seriously flawed, that there was more than one person firing at President Kennedy, and that there was a conspiracy to assassinate JFK. The corrupt U.S. Department of Justice contradicted the House Select Committee's report. However, the American people believed the Select Committee and not the corrupt Justice Department, which never tells the truth about anything. <laughs> By 2013, polls showed that most Americans are conspiracy cooks who do not believe the official government line on JFK's assassination. So with regard to JFK's assassination, the conspiracy theories are in the majority. The minority are the Americans who cannot escape their brainwashing. And isn't that the truth, eh? With many things, actually. In a few days, it will be the 15th anniversary of the alleged Al-Qaeda attack on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. 
who are witnessing the, fine, uh, the fading protection that the charge of conspiracy theorists provides for the official government story. Indeed, the official 9-11 story is collapsing before our eyes. It says, Europhysics, this respected publication of the European Physics uh, com Community, has published an article by scientists who conclude that the evidence points overwhelmingly to the conclusion that all three World Trade Center buildings were destroyed by controlled demolition. And that was obviously the time for those who, who knew. You know. Few American scientists can admit that because their careers depend on U.S. government and military security complex research contracts. And that's so true. The easiest folk to control are folk who are licensed folks. That's, that's because for doctors or whatever, you know, it's easy to control people like that. You know. And and folk who are in the military and security, and so they can get bumped off too if they were to come out and say anything. They know that as well. They, they know more, way more than they'll ever tell you, including who's been bumped off in the past for different things as well. So they know. Independent scientists are the, uh, in the U.S. are a vanishing breed, an endangered species. The scientists say that in view of their findings, it's morally imperative that 9-11 be the subject of a truly scientific and impartial investigation by responsible authorities. So now we're faced with a peculiar situation. The scientifically ignorant two-bit punk American prostitutes claim to know more than the editors of the Journal of the European Physics Community and the scientists who did the investigations. Don't you think it far-fetched that ignorant, corrupt and cowardly American journalists who lie for money, but they're all in the CFR, uh, no more than f uh, physicists, uh, chemists and 2,700 high-rise architects and structural engineers who have called on the U.S. Congress to launch a real investigation of 9-11. Firefighters and first responders who were on the WT scene, military and civilian uh, pilots and former high government officials, all of whom are on record challenging the unbelievable and physically impossible official story of 9-11. What kind of a <laughs> dumb uh, fecal matter, I guess, moron does a person have to be to believe that the United States government and its media whores know better than the laws of physics. Well, they've done that before. They've done a lot of good stuff on, on bending the laws of physics. You know, it's not the first time. It says the ability of the press to choose to influence Americans seems to be on the decline. The media ganged up on Donald Trump during the Republican and primaries in, in, uh, intending to deny Trump the nomination, but the voters ignored the press to But again, don't, don't ever fall for this, that, and the other as well. Think for yourself, folks. But it says in the current presidential campaign, Hillary is not the runaway winner that the prostitutes are trying to make her, and despite the propaganda ministry, the legs under an official 9-11 story are wobbly, to say the least. Indeed, the official 9-11 story already has lost credibility with the American public. And last April, a Rasmussen poll found that Americans doubt they have been told all the facts about September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks on the U.S. and strongly believe the government should come clean. Uh, the YouGov poll in 2013 found that 50% of Americans have doubts about the government's account of 9-11, which shows the public is far more intelligent and less corrupt than the prostitutes who are paid to lie to the public. And that is true, they're all paid to lie. They know it too, you know. As I say, as soon as you're born, there's a stack of organizations all, all vying for control of your brain. This poll also found that as a consequence of the cover-up uh, job performed by the American prostitutes, 46% of Americans were not even aware that a third WTC building, which is Building 7, collapsed on September 11th. And, and they've all seen it. And it's true enough, it has, but it's way out long after. There's no, no plane hit it. But anyway, I, I, you know, I, <laughs> I knew years ago that um, there's a cure for all that, you know. It's a, a way to avoid all future terrorist attacks. You see, I realized that, that they had, because they did, they claimed that they did, they claim uh, that Rumsfeld and all these guys, you know, from the New American Century Group and Cheney, they, they were having a practice of that very thing happening at the World Trade Center that day, that very day. That all came out in the time as well. And it also came out that they had all the groups in, FEMA and all the rest of them, in for this practice, you see. And, and of course, they, they even told um, the Air Force to stand down because they always take off when a plane comes under the radar idea and it's going off its flight path and, and so on. And they always have the, the Air Force scrambling jets. Well, they, they call it, tell them to stand off and stand, stand down because it's a practice, etc. No, no, and it turned out to be real, etc. And then in Britain, 
the the seven seven bombers supposedly uh, hit the exact places on that same day, in the same bus even uh, that they were using for a practice bombing. Uh, and so, the, so there'll be no more bombings if we ban tests and practices. There's, that's my answer to it all. You understand that? Just ban them all. And obviously, since it always happens when the governments are having test bombings about things, there'll be no more bombings. Just ban the tests. Very simple, isn't it? That's always an easy answer, isn't it? So you see, it's about time, folk. Well, if they can, you know. A lot of folk don't want to know about things like this. And I've met them face to face. That they don't want to have bad news. They don't want to know about what bail-ins are to the banks. Right? Oh, I don't, don't want to hear that. That's too scary. Yeah. Too scary. They don't want the, the happy, happy stuff to get on the, you know. All of the news ends up with nonsense stories to keep them happy. The nonsense things, you know. And, and a lot of folk want that now. It's too, too scary for them. That's how they've been trained to be. Anyway, this article goes on and on by Roberts, and it's, it's quite good. And, um, but again, there's many articles saying the same kind of thing, too. And, uh, but it's true enough. I mean, it doesn't matter, too. I said at the time, see, all, these, all the cons that they use to get things into war, to get something through, uh, it doesn't matter if it's found out eventually, because they've achieved their objectives by then. Well, they have. You're, you've got a world where they've got constant surveillance, constant terrorism, constant blah, blah, blah. And so they achieved the objectives, plus they gave themselves the right to go after all the countries on the list that they published in the 90s, 1990s, an American the project for a new American century group. They published it twice, actually, uh, and, and, and take them, uh, bombed them back into the Stone Age. They were successful. You see, they needed a reason for doing it, and even said they would need a new Pearl Harbor event to motivate the public support behind them. Well, they got it all, you see. So it doesn't matter if it's exposed now. They're not going to throw up their arms and say, oh, well, we're going to take all the surveillance off you and yada, yada, yada. No, no, won't happen. And that's how it is, folks. That's how it is. Anyway, as I say, you know, you can only take what your brain can bear at, the, at that moment. And, and life is not made easy for us, isn't it? It's always got more worries, more problems, yada, yada, yada. That's how they control us all. From Hamish myself from Ontario, Canada, it's good night to me. Your God, your God, school with you. <laughs>